Georgia is the most competitive battleground state in the United States. All eyes are on Georgia, DeKalb County. The whole country is watching Georgia voters to see what we will do at this historic moment. John Ossoff there confirming what we all know, that all eyes of the political world have fallen on Georgia. With the president finally signing the COVID relief package last night, it's no surprise that both parties' campaigns in Georgia are attempting to spin the decision. Late last night, the state's two Republican senators released a joint statement vowing to fight alongside the president, who's leaving office, but made no mention of his previous request to increase stimulus checks to $2,000. Meanwhile, the Democrats are sounding the alarm, calling on supporters to raise more money in an effort to compete with their GOP rivals with just over a week to go. Joining us now is Tia Mitchell, reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, who was at that rally earlier. Tia, great to speak with you. So I know that these rallies are difficult, right? There's social distancing, there's COVID concerns. How big a turnout are they getting in DeKalb County, which is one of the areas where Ossoff and Warnock would really have to have a tremendous amount of enthusiasm? Well, today's rally, which was in South DeKalb County, is targeted not only at Black voters, but at young Black voters. There were rap performances, the mistress of ceremonies was Regina Carter, who's Lil Wayne's daughter. And there was a pretty big turnout. I would say a couple hundred cars and several hundred people. It's a, As you noted, it's not like a Republican rally where everyone's out and standing around where you can really gauge crowd size. Democrats like to do these driving rallies. So it's a lot of cars and people tune in on their radios to hear the audio. But it was a pretty big turnout. I was at a different driving rally yesterday at a church. I can tell you this one that was rap focused and focused on young people was about twice the size. <laughs> Why does that not surprise me in the ATL? Tia, uh, <laughs> one of the things that, that we hear a lot about, those of us who aren't down there in Georgia right now, is the ridiculous amount of money being spent on the air campaign, ads sort of flying back and forth one way or another. When you're talking to people on the ground, when you're communicating with people, are the ads really having an impact? Are they making people enthusiastic? Or have they sort of tuned that out because it's a week to go before the election, they already decided what they were going to do? I think people are tuning out the ads because they're kind of over all the ads. There's been a, it's oversaturated. But I do think when people are listening in the messaging, it's helping people make the case for their candidates. I don't think it's changing a lot of minds, but the ads are reinforcing what each side feels about the candidate as well as what they feel about the opposition. And the goal of the ads is, again, to urge people to make sure they get out and vote. Makes a lot of sense. Tia Mitchell, thank you so very much for speaking to us today. Let's bring in Julian Castro, former HUD secretary under Obama, as well as the former mayor of San Antonio. Uh, secretary Castro, it is a great honor to speak to you. I have followed you, enjoyed your campaign watching you. You were a part of many uh, Democratic candidates from the 2020 primary and Democrats from across the country who have campaigned for Warnock and Ossoff. What did you see when you were down there, and, and what did you hope to accomplish by adding your name to the list of prominent Democrats campaigning for them? Yeah, it's great to be with you, uh, Jason. Uh, well, a couple of weeks ago, I was there in Georgia, in the Atlanta area, and then we went to uh, the University of Georgia there in Athens and had a great event with students. What I saw above everything else was real enthusiasm for two great candidates, for Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. And also, you could tell that people understand the stakes of this election. They understand uh, with, if they're a working family, if they're a small business owner, that what happens uh, on January 5th is going to impact the ability of Joe Biden and the House of Representatives to work with the Senate to get important things done for those working families, for those small business owners for people who find themselves on the brink of eviction. So you could just, you could tell it wasn't just like any other Senate race, that uh, that people understand how important this is. And, uh, you know, I, my hope and my belief is that that's going to translate into tremendous turnout for these two Democratic candidates. So, uh, you know, on the level of excitement, right, there have been several major Senate campaigns in the last couple of years that Democrats got excited about. They got excited about Texas, they got excited about South Carolina, but Georgia's a little different. Georgia is a, is a state that is growing. It's become, in my view, the new Ohio, the new important swing state. And one of the reasons for that is the large and growing AAPI and Latino population in the state. 
what's sort of the goal for, for Latino turnout? And when you speak to the organizations down there that are dedicated to turning about Latino voters, what are the challenges they're facing and what are they looking forward to uh, happening on next Tuesday? Oh, you're right about the state. Also, I mean, one way that I would distinguish it from Texas, my home state that I'm coming to you from, that we have great hopes for in cycles ahead, is that Georgia has proven itself, right? I mean, it just gave its electoral votes to Joe Biden uh, and largely on uh, the, the uh, turnout of uh, African-Americans, of uh, the API community and of the Latino community. So we know that there are over 370,000 um, Latinos there in Georgia who are eligible to vote and about 250,000 who were registered as of about a month ago. Uh, there have been massive efforts to try and register more folks uh, before the registration deadline and to turn them out. Now, what are some of the challenges to that? For a lot of folks, they haven't voted before. This is new. All of right. the challenges that we're seeing as well, reaching out to folks during uh, this COVID time period, door knocking, for instance, isn't happening as much as it normally would if we weren't in a pandemic. Um, money certainly is not an issue. We saw the, the record-breaking haul that Ossoff and Warnock had, uh, but still, anytime you're talking to people who haven't made voting a habit, that is a challenge. To their credit, both of these candidates are doing Spanish language media. Uh, they're reaching out uh, to community groups like Galeo, which is probably the most established uh, Georgia Latino elected official um, and community group there, and others, so that they can turn out people who don't normally get out in the Latinx community. That's it's fantastic. Uh, you know, I have to ask you while you're here, you have been a, a very, very loyal Democrat. And, and despite, I will say this in my opinion, a bit of a snub at the Democratic convention, you have been committed to the Democratic Party and working very, very hard. And, and I have to ask you, heading into this new administration, there's been a lot of criticism of the Biden administration, whether they have been as diverse enough in their selections, whether they've picked enough Latino Americans, whether they've picked enough African Americans. As someone who was a part of a diverse administration under Obama, what kinds of things and what kinds of people would you like to see Joe Biden looking to uh, to bring into this administration so that it reflects the coalition that actually got him elected? Yeah, well, you know, I think he's made some great selections. And just within the, the Latino community, uh, you take folks like uh, Javier Becerra and uh, Mr. Mayorkas and Mr. Uh, Cardona, uh, still has not appointed a Latina. And I think that I hope that that uh, oversight uh, will will be addressed. Um, uh, tremendous, I think, talent in terms of the African American community. I, I do think that uh, the AAPI community needs to be better represented. Um, it was historic to see Congresswoman Holland uh, nominated to be Interior Secretary uh, because it was unconscionable that there had never been, uh, and until she's not until she's appointed, there will not have been an appointed cabinet member who was Native American. All of that is good, but it's also still a work in progress. You have to balance, I think, people who have been around Washington from a long, for a long time with fresh, new voices that can add the kind of perspective that will give some dynamism, I think, um, and a new direction to the years ahead. And I have confidence, though, in, in Vice President uh, Biden and in Vice President-to-be Kamala Harris. Uh, I think that they understand that. And uh, Donald Trump, four years ago, told people that he was going to surround himself with the best people, the most talented people. And that turned out not to be true. That was quite right. a lie. In fact, it was the opposite. Fortunately, I think President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris are going to surround themselves, because we already have evidence of this, with some of the best, most talented, most dedicated public servants who have a strong vision that is inclusive and is going to make sure that even the most vulnerable communities out there are well served. And we need that because we're in an emergency right now with COVID-19. Well, since we're talking about the best people, I have to ask, if you get that call, would you join this new administration? You've already served. You were clearly a better uh, HUD secretary than, than Dr. Ben Carson. Would you be willing to be a part of this new administration? Uh, you know, I haven't uh, put anything on the table and I hadn't taken anything off the table. Of course, I would take a call. If, if I received one. It was the honor of my lifetime to serve President Obama as HUD secretary. Uh, and uh, I know that this next administration is going to do a tremendous job for the people that all of us care about 
And so, of course, I would have that conversation. Uh, but I also know that, uh, you know, whatever happens with me, that uh, Vice President-elect uh, Harris and President-elect Biden are going to have a great team that will much better serve America than what we've had over the last four years. And that's what's important, you know, who, that, that people who urgently need help right now get that help. If I could just say, Jason, one last thing, you know, with these Georgia Senate runoffs, what we need right now is not divided, squabbling government. What we need is um, for Joe Biden to have a House of Representatives and a Senate that he can actually work with, people rowing in the same direction. So anybody watching in Georgia, if you're like on the bubble and you really are one of those swing voters, although I know there's less of them these days, we're in an emergency. We're in a crisis. What you need right now is not squabbling and divided government. You actually need to give Joe Biden partners that he can work with to get things done for you and your family. And I hope the Georgian will respond to that. I, I hope they do. I hope they respond to your message. Julian Castro, thank you so very much for spending some time with us today. Thank you. Up next, new information in the search for answers around that Christmas Day explosion in Nashville, Tennessee.